Uh, in some ways, this is the culmination of the day because it's talking about what might we be able to do about this. And, um, you know, before we actually I turn it over to Zephyr, uh, you know, just you know, Senator Klobuchar uh, just in the last panel mentioned this decision just on Monday. Uh, that came out of the FTC, essentially overturning, you know, the net neutrality ruling from 2015. She mentioned the Sinclair roll-up, you know, this, this sort of creation of a de facto network, kind of out of nothing, um, out of a bunch of what should have been local outlets. Um, by the end of this panel, we will probably have a decision. We're due to have a decision in the case in which the government is challenging the AT&T's proposed takeover of Time Warner. Uh, you know, so this is an incredibly important moment in multiple ways in the United States uh, for the future of journalism. So, for that reason, uh, this next panel is, um, you know, is probably the most important part of their day. It's it's our opportunity to talk about uh, what specifically, what kind of actions we can we can take. Um, we've heard a couple of proposals already. We heard from Robert Thompson the idea of a algorithmic transparency board or an algorithmic review board. I, I kind of like the sound of the first one better, um, just because it has the word transparency in it. Uh, we heard Senator Klobuchar talk about how Washington State, the Attorney General in Washington State, has actually got Google to back out from carrying political ads in that state, which is not necessarily a good thing. But it shows. It does show that the uh, uh, the we are at the point where a state AG can actually affect real change. Um, and I think that um, uh, one other thing I want to point out is we're going to have this. This panel is going to start with a short talk by a very good friend, uh, Richard John, who is a historian. And I trust for the last 35 years has really been taken over by economists. We have a bunch of number crunchers who have decided for us what's the best way to organize our political economy. As Richard John can certainly tell you, that is an anomaly in American history. For the first 200 years of our nation, it was the people who decided how to organize the, our political economy. We did not use economists to decide for us. <laughs> I hope that one of the solutions, I don't know if this panel is going to talk about it, is actually just getting the economists out of the room, getting the economists out of the decision chain. They shouldn't be there. They have no job. In, um, th that is not their job. Uh, Zephyr Teachout is going to run this next panel. Zephyr's a, a very good friend. I've known her for a long time. She was the chair of our board at, uh, at Open Markets until quite recently. Uh, she has stepped down from that position, and she's running for attorney general in New York. Um, the um, uh, Zephyr is a professor at, at Fordham of Law, and um, she is... Um, uh, one of the things that we worked on somewhat together, or I gave her, I helped her sort of uh, give her an opportunity to do this, was uh, her first book a couple of years ago, which came, uh, was Corruption in America, was published by Harvard University Press in 2014. And when she wrote that, she was a fellow in Open Markets when Open Markets was part of New America. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Zephyr, but I do want to point out that we have Jason White from Facebook on this panel, and there's been a lot of discussion in different panels about, you know, has Google, has Google made more of an effort to work with publishers? Has Facebook made more of an effort? Uh, all I can say today is that we have Facebook here. And I think it's, you know, given the discussions today, uh, given the, uh, the um, you know, the general uh, tone, um, you know, I think it's uh, terrific that Jason is uh, up here with us today. So anyway, I'm going to turn it over to Zephyr. Great. Thank you very much. 
Good afternoon. <laughs> we are going to have a lively panel. <laughs> well, you are all waiting. Can you hear me? Or is this is this working? It doesn't sound like it's working. It's working. Okay. <laughs> we are going to have a lively panel, and um, we are going to start with uh, uh, Professor Richard John from Columbia digging up the old tools <laughs> to go to battle. Um, he's going to give a slightly longer presentation. And then we are going to turn it over next, despite the order you see in your, in your sheet, to Jason White and give him a real chance um, to, to speak again for a little longer, seven or eight minutes, um, because Facebook has come up so many times. And we are really delighted that he is here um, to, to present the Facebook uh, perspective. Um, and then I will introduce the other three panelists, and we'll go into uh, a, a discussion. But why don't we s settle in with the history? The goal of this panel is first, as with all panels, tell the truth. What's the world you see? But second, what are the tools we can use, both in the private, individually, corporate, and public, governments, activists, realm, to uh, grapple with some of these issues that we face? So I turn it over to Professor John. Thanks very much, uh, Zephyr. And thank uh, Barry for the gracious uh, introduction, something of a mutual admiration society. I'm a great fan of Cornered. So I'm here to talk about uh, the founders and the history of uh, free expression relationship with the press. How could the government best support the press? And as it happens, that was among the issues that the lawmakers in Philadelphia discussed during the congressional debate that preceded the enactment of the landmark Post Office Act of 1792. Some favored monopoly. Others, open access. Open access prevailed. In lieu of granting monopoly to the pro-administration Gazette of the United States, lawmakers decided to admit every single newspaper into the mail at the same exceedingly favorable rate. George Washington supported legislation to admit every newspaper in the mail absolutely free of charge. Virginia Congressman James Madison objected to the postage-free circulation. Lawmakers eventually agreed on an exceedingly low rate. Bottom line, newspapers made up 95% of the weight of the mail. They generated no more than 15% of the revenue. The founders' media policy, in short, presupposed that the government should subsidize news reporting on an open access, non preferential basis in the conviction that the circulation of information on public affairs was essential to the perpetuation of free institutions. At the core of this policy was not the First Amendment, which would not become important in American media policy until the 20th century, of course important today. Instead, what was key was the establishment of what might, one might one, one, my, one might call a media platform in which commercial transactions subsidize the news because the merchants paid the postage, the newspapers circulate. The eight minutes I've been allotted, I've been asked to survey the relationship of the government to news reporting from the 18th century to the present. In this history, three themes stand out. First, news reporting has always been regulated in various ways, mostly at the state and municipal level, even though no government has thankfully ever seriously contemplated the licensing of journalists. Second, disruptive innovations, political, technical, economic, have altered the information infrastructure multiple times. A reminder that the changes set in motion with the rise of the so-called social media platforms operated by Google, Facebook, Twitter, are in key respects not unprecedented. And technology isn't always the key. Third, that the informational environment for news reporting has almost always been structured around market channeling institutional arrangements that helped pay for the news. So to put it differently, it's never really resembled a free marketplace of ideas, a metaphor that would not become popularized until the mid 20th century, and a metaphor that, in my views, is peculiarly inapposite to understand the circumstances that confront us in the digital media environment of today. 
When Alexis de Tocqueville visited the United States in 1831, you knew we'd get to Tocqueville, he was astonished at the enormous number of newspapers that were in circulation, not only along the Atlantic seaboard, big cities, but also in the wilds of Detroit, Michigan, then on the very edge of the western frontier. Tocqueville mistakenly assumed that in the United States there was no legislation to censor the press ever enacted. Tocqueville was wrong. Lawholders in the slaveholding states had long blocked the circulation of information on the slavery question. Barry Lynn referred to that. Amos Kendall, 1835. Lawmakers in the North and South regulated publications on sensitive religious, political, and moral topics. Even so, Tocqueville was right to be astonished. The democratic society that he chronicled, the first in world history, would have been inconceivable without the massive subsidization by the federal government of the distribution of a vast amount of information on public affairs. Most newspaper advertising was local, which helped to decentralize the informational environment, but the government subsidized the circulation of newspapers, and it also permitted every newspaper in the country to receive one copy of every other newspaper free of charge. That's how news brokerage worked in that time. The informational environment of Madison and Washington would be transformed by the commercialization of the electric telegraph in the 1840s and the commercialization of radio in the 1920s. In each instance, lawmakers blocked institutional arrangements that would have fostered monopoly. New York Telegraph Act of 1840 weakened Samuel Morse's patent-based telegraph monopoly, and in so doing, greatly strengthened the New York City newspaper press, as was the intention of the bill's sponsor, a founder of the country's first great newsbreaker, a newsbroker, New York Associated Press. The Radio Act of 1927 preempted the establishment of a federal government-sanctioned quasi-monopoly radio station analogous to the BBC. It was an anti-monopoly law. This outcome was anathema to the leaders of the, na of the nascent broadcasting industry. So relatively big players blocked monopoly. Hostility toward the monopolization of news outlets was long a fixture of public policy. Anti-monopoly ideas, for example, lay behind many Many of the lawsuits against newspapers and broadcasters that were initiated by the FCC and furnished a major rationale for the epochal 1945 Supreme Court ruling that declared unconstitutional the exclusive contracts that the Associated Press had negotiated with many of the country's leading newspapers. In the Anglo-American world, Advertising has subsidized news reporting since the 18th century. And this was a theme of a collection of original essays that I co-edited a couple years ago for Oxford entitled Making News. So there's my advertisement. Advertising's always been key. With the rise of Facebook and Google, however, the advertising base for journalism, which until the 2000s remained highly local localized, this market remained highly localized, not only for print, but also for broadcasting. Philanthropy was also important, say, for example, for Du Bois' crisis in 1910. Newspapers and even radio and television stations long reported on local news, cheered for local sports teams, and respected local sentiment. And for the historian, this shift is perhaps the most momentous to take place in the journalistic firmament in the two decades or so since the commercialization of the internet in the 1990s. That is to say, the, what is the shift? The funding of news is no longer tied to localities as it had been since the founding of the Republic. James Madison wrote a great deal about communications in The Federalist. Assumptions about communications undergird his famous argument about faction in Federalist 10. He also wrote about communications in an unpublished essay on the informational environment in the New Republic. Editorial commentary on public affairs, Madison assumed, should remain highly localized. Editorial comment should remain localized. News could be nationwide. If editorial comment were not localized, or so he wrote in a remarkable memorandum in the early 1790s, the republic would be doomed. For Madison, no less than for Andrew Jackson's postmaster general, Amos Kendall, who as Barry mentioned, confronted this trans-local abolitionist-sponsored information flood in the 1830s. For Madison, as well as for radio and television broadcasters up until the recent past, opinion remained largely, if never entirely, localized. News was not. 
The recent furor or Russian interference in U.S. election thrusts into high relief this often overlooked yet for the historian essential fact. Communications, locality, and democracy are linked. Today, with the rise of social media, these relationships have been fundamentally challenged. Monopoly in communication posed for the founders of the republic an existential threat. Who, more than two centuries later, can be so certain that the founders were wrong? Thank you. <laughs> Next up again, we have Jason White, who is the Director of News Partnerships for Facebook. Thank you, Jason. All right. Thank you, Zephyr. Uh, and thank you, Richard, for that uh, fat, fascinating run through uh, the history of antitrust in the news. Um, it's been a great discussion today of some vital issues. I know a lot of people have expressed frustration with aspects of Facebook's business and some of the other major platforms that news organizations work with. Uh, it's certainly been helpful to hear your feedback, uh, and I'm appreciative of the opportunity that Open Markets and Barry Lynn have given us today to come and connect with you and, and be up here and engage with our, our fellow panelists. There's no question that news is the backbone of an informed public, and it's vital that we have a healthy news ecosystem. And we at Facebook have an important role to play at that. Yes, it's a Facebook employee saying we have an important role to play in having a healthy news <laughs> ecosystem. Um, a little bit about me. Before joining Facebook, I was a journalist for about a dozen years. Uh, I worked as a reporter, writer, producer. I was at the PBS NewsHour, CNN, and most recently, NBC News. I care deeply about this industry, where it's going. Uh, I'm certainly not an antitrust or regulatory expert like some other folks uh, on the panel here. Um, like so many journalists, I started in local news. Uh, I was a freelancer for the New Haven Register. They paid me $40 per article. It was enough as a grad student to get a little coffee and a little beer, and that's about it. Um, after graduation, I actually went to work for a nonprofit news organization, organization funded by the Pew Charitable Trust. This is the early 2000s, and this organization was founded to help fill the gaps that were caused as, as newspapers were laying off their statehouse reporters. So even in the early 2000s, you saw this local news business model start to be disrupted to the point that major foundations were stepping in with cash to try to address this challenge. So this is something I've been interested in and working on for a long time. Um, certainly conditions in local in particular have worsened over the 18 years that I've been in this field. I joined Facebook about five years ago uh, as I saw the beginnings of an evolution in how people were accessing news and information, driven in large part, I think, by the form factor of the phone, but then also these new networks that were springing up where people weren't just passively reading, they were active sharers of the information that they were reading and they were commenting on it. It's a fundamental and important change. Uh, and if you can believe it, just five years ago, not that many news organizations were interested even in Facebook and what we were talking about and what was going on in the platform. You had a few like a BuzzFeed or a Huffington Post, but for most, we were a very, very, very small part of the business and an equally small part of their mind share, I would think. Certainly that changed over the past few years as more, part, more publishers developed strategies for Facebook and other platforms like Snapchat and YouTube and Twitter. And more consumers started using these platforms to check the occasional news story as they caught up with friends and family. It's important to remember that as much as we're talking about Facebook and these platforms in the news today, the primary and fundamental purpose of Facebook is to connect people with each other. People come there to connect with their friends and family and see what they're up to. News is a part of that, but it's actually a pretty small part overall of the platform. Um, along the way, we developed more formats to help people connect with the content they care about, like instant articles and video. In fact, video was not even a thing on Facebook just five year, years ago. It's kind of crazy how much things have changed. And we became a source of referral traffic for many publishers and a place where they can build branded content businesses like Axios and BuzzFeed have and market their subscription offerings like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and some of the local publishers we heard from earlier have done so well. It's also a place where their journalists might discover new stories they want to cover. And many of our local publishers are able to build community with their audiences through groups. We know many publishers are uncomfortable with the role we play in the news ecosystem, and much remains to be figured out when it comes to how we work together. In many ways, these are still very early days. The good news, I think, is that information is more accessible than ever, and both independent journalism and established outfits have expanded their reach to new and more diverse audiences. 
We've seen the rise of new digital publishers, even in the local space, like Billy Penn and the Charlotte Agenda. It is certainly a dynamic place to be. The publishing ecosystem, we're all trying to figure out how to make the dollars and cents work, but I think it's still a very exciting space to be in. Um, at the same time, we've seen many traditional publishers forced to rethink and adapt their revenue models, often with far fewer resources, again, especially in local. So some of what we're up to at Facebook. Earlier this year, we made our most important decision about news since it started appearing in Newsfeed just a decade ago. And that is we are giving priority to high quality news. This is news that we define as broadly trusted, informative, and local. These are things that our, the people that use Facebook have told us they want out of the news that they are seeing on our platform. We know that social media enables people to spread information at an incredible rate, and that if we don't specifically tackle problems like fake news or spam, then we also could end up amplifying those. And so we've also taken proactive measures to downplay the, the junkier content that you might see on a platform where people are actively sharing. The clickbait, the ad farms, these are the publishers trying to take advantage of consumers. We've also developed a third party fact checking program where we work with independent journalists to actually verify content that's been flagged as problematic on fake Facebook. This includes the Associated Press, PolitiFact, Snopes, factcheck.org. Um, that program has been shown to actually reduce the distribution of fake news by about 80% when a story has been checked. We're also doing more to support the businesses of quality publishers. We heard earlier about this huge shift toward digital subscriptions in the industry. I think certainly this is a healthy trend. If you're creating content that people want to pay for, it's definitely different than if you're just chasing clicks. So we are introducing friction within Facebook for the first time. We've never had a one-click free policy. Publishers have always been able to put up a paywall in whatever kind of content that they would like to. Um, but within Instant Articles, which is actually a native surface that lives within Facebook, we're introducing a paywall. And some key features of that, publishers control where they set the meter. They could actually lock all their content if they want to. They process that transaction with the consumer. So they keep all the data. They have a direct relationship with that consumer and 100% of the revenue. We're also doing more on the video front. We developed a new surface that we call Facebook Watch, uh, and we're even directly subsidizing the content of some, some uh, video for that from Fox News, CNN, some digital startups like Attention and Mike, also working with Advance in the local space, who came to us with a great idea they wanted to execute. And then in local, we've done more to grow our partnerships team so we can give more of these publishers the support they deserve. We're developing a new surface to bring more local content to the fore, and we've launched a local news accelerator that you heard a little bit about before from Terry, where we're bringing in newspaper executives from 14 metro papers. These are smaller than the New York Times and the Washington Post of the world, uh, and putting them through uh, an ambitious, rigorous three-month curriculum to help them grow their digital subscription business and then give them a grant so they can execute on a specific project that they come up with. So you can call me crazy, but I'm actually optimistic about where all this is going. Consumers have more choices than ever before, and more voices are able to find audiences than ever before. Surely there are big challenges when it comes to business models, especially in local, but I'm confident that partnership and innovation will help us chart a course toward the future. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, Jason. Um, next up, we have uh, three uh, really extraordinary panelists, and I do want to remind everybody that right immediately following this panel, by the way, we'll have some discussion, chance for question and answer. Uh, Congressman Cicilline is going to speak without a break. So uh, we have these three extraordinary panelists. Um, uh, Olivier Sylvain, who is um, my colleague at Fordham Law School. Um, and has done some of the most interesting writing and thinking about uh, big tech and about uh, uh, 230, which he's going to talk about. Um, Christian de Kuna, who is right at the heart of what is happening in Europe. He's the head of the private office of um, the European Data Protection Supervisor, um, and is going to tell us a little bit about both what is happening already with GDPR and also his own views about the limitations of, of what's already in place and where we can go. And then we're really privileged to have um, a chairman, former chairman uh, Tom Wheeler here, um, who as you all know, um, I believe it was 
February 26th, 2015. A great day. A great day. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, promulgated net neutrality rules, and uh, that is obviously very much on all of our minds this week. Um, so to talk about where he sees the state of play, but also to talk more broadly, not just about net neutrality, but how the principle of neutrality might, uh, we might think about the principle of neut neutrality in other areas. Um, so I, we're going to start um, with Professor Sylvain. So Olivier. <laughs> Um, thank you, Zephyr. It's great to see you. Yeah, I haven't seen you recently, um, for good reason. Um, we're all rooting for you uh, in New York uh, at Boredom. Um, I am um, going to talk about Section 230 of Title 47, what some of you have already called out in the audience, and that is the Communications Decency Act, that provision in US law that immunizes Google and Facebook for the bad content that their users post. Um, some people have asked why an exemption or immunity for online intermediaries and not the same for traditional publishers. Uh, and I'd like to frame this by thinking about two questions. And, and Zephyr, you made a point just now that makes me think actually there are three questions. One is, how do you regulate social responsibility for inform in information markets? Second, who is a publisher? And third, what is neutrality? Um, so what I'm going to just do is, is, is we'll get into the um, you know pers pers kind of the, the proposal discussion afterwards. I'm just going to look at lay out what I think are some of the issues with regards to Section 230. And on the question of how to regulate social responsibility, it's a it's something of a of a provocation. Is it does it come with law? Is law the best place to ensure that intermediaries or information? intermediaries are um, acting responsibly. For better or worse, a whole suite of public laws do indeed apply to traditional publishers. We've heard a little bit about how defamation and libel and civil rights laws right, have always historically applied to publishers so that if they distribute something that is original with someone else, they are still obliged under law to be to, to mine for it. They are, um, there's, there's no, there's no Ignorance, once they've gotten notice. You can't claim ignorance once you've gotten notice that there's bad content. Online intermediaries under Section 230 are exempt from this foundational concept in the Anglo-American tradition. Um, so Google, for example, is not liable for fraud on YouTube. right? And Facebook is not liable for defamatory posts um, on its um, platform. Craigslist is not, is not liable for discriminatory housing ads. So we've been talking a lot about antitrust. Some of you have wanted to talk about Section 230. I'm glad you do, because I think this is an action. Uh, Section 230 is a key piece of what we should be thinking about with regards to markets in which intermediaries moderate or really leverage their dominant position in two markets, user-facing markets and advertising markets. And that's what I want to talk about on the question of what or who is a publisher. The 230 immunity emerges out in, in 1996 in the interest of, pr of protecting conduits, neutral conduits, passive conduits that enable users to post things without worrying about liability for that. And the argument is to encourage innovation and free speech. Right? So we've got electronic bulletin boards in the mid to late 1990s. Right? AOL is held out as an opportunity for users to post all manner of things. This is encouraging a kind of free speech um, notion uh, for good reason. Um, then Re Representative Wyden, now Senator Wyden, um, were, was a big proponent of a dynamic free speech platform. They were also worried about the chilling effects associated with having to regulate content, what some people call collateral censorship, so that Facebook or, or Google would, would censor more speech than necessary um, with the mind that they might be pursued in court. So that's the other reason the immunity emerges. Now, the, there's an irony here that the title of this statute is the Good Samaritan Statute. The Good Samaritan Statute provision under the CDA really actually creates a safe harbor. And that is, the, as I read it, you only get immunity to the extent that you are in good faith, taking good faith efforts to moderate bad content out. Right? So we don't want governments getting involved in this because we worry about government censoring. Intermediaries, if you're going to do this, you've got to take good faith efforts to do so voluntarily. The courts have operationalized this so that the only way in which an intermediary is liable is if they materially contribute to content. 
One question for us is, what do we do with platforms that don't resemble anything like the publishers before 1996 or in the mid to late 1990s, where they are leveraging their market position to do things that were not known to most of us until, very, until the past five to eight, 10 years, where they are um, using user information and finding things about us that we don't know and delivering that information to others. Is that publishing? Is that what 230 was addressed to? If not, we might have to think about rejiggering the balance in the interest of a free speech platform online. Thank you. Uh, Christian, um, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts from the uh, other side of, uh, of the ocean. What is happening? You know, without going into great detail, a little bit about what you see happening already with GDPR, and what do you think are the limitations and the policy frontiers in Europe? Sure, thanks, Seth. Um, uh, it's nice uh, for the EU to be invited here. I thought you didn't, you guys didn't like us anymore, but uh, <laughs> thanks very much. It's only one guy. <laughs> the GDPR was trending above Beyonce briefly a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> which is not bad for a law. Um, uh, freedom of speech and, and freedom of the press, uh, privacy and non-discrimination are part of a suite of rights in the EU's Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is a much younger and much more verbose equivalent of the US Constitution. Uh, they're underpinned by the right to human dignity, they're in the interdependent, um, they're like interlocking cogs in a machine. And you need private, intimate space in order to have, uh, in order to be free to think, to uh, be yourself or yourselves, uh, to speak, to, um, to decide who to listen to, and to associate with other people. Um, and alongside these, these uh, rights and freedoms, there's the right to data protection. Um, now, the, ge the General Data Protection Regulation is actually an obligation on the part of the EU and the EU's founding treaty, um, it's required to pass such a law. Um, it's the, the one that's just come into full applicability is actually, um, it's, it's an old new law. Um, it's long and again somewhat verbose, but it's old in, in, in the sense that since 1995 there have been the same principles in place. What has changed is that perhaps the, the scope of the law is clearer, um, which, is, which is why um, companies around the world have, have, have really taken note of it. Um, but I wanted just briefly to, to, to suggest three things to remember about the GDPR plus one. Um, the, the three things are incentives, control and accountability. The plus one is that it's not actually enough to fix a lot of the problems that we've been talking about today. So first of all, incentives. Um, the GDPR is a deliberate attempt by the EU to steer innovation away from harmful behaviour at a time of crisis and unease. Like the financial crisis uh, which, which broke out 10 or 11 years ago, the digital information ecosystem is a universe that no one can explain and that lots of people think that it is, an, is unjust. Um, the GDPR is trying to encourage uh, alternative business models. Um, when we uh, when we talk about harm um, and manipulation, we say that the um, within this ecosystem, people are hit three times. It's a triple whammy. The first the first hit is that they are tracked um, in all sorts of different ways, most of which they're not aware of. The second hit is that they're then categorised, they're put into a box, they're put into a profile. The third is that they're then fed uh, information in order to elicit responses. That could be a purchase. It could be um, uh, joining a group. It could be um, as we're seeing, in, as we has been revealed in the last few months, the last year and a half, to, to vote or not vote um, in a certain way. Um, now, the other th the other problem is that um, the surveillance is so pervasive that it's, it, children in particular are being targeted. They're under surveillance like never before. Um, their attention is is a commodity, and techniques like autoplay are determined by algorithms um, in a way that uh, it has, has an almost hypnotizing effect. And it isn't only over here that this is a problem, or in Europe. Um, in China recently, or last year, there was a big controversy amongst parents about the Honor of Kings uh, free to uh, free, free, um, freemium game on, on mobile apps. Uh, which, were, which was generating 11% of revenue of the fourth biggest internet company in the world um, uh, on the grounds that it was addicting children to, to, that, to that game. 
So uh, we're trying to change incentives. The second issue is, is control. Um, consent is one means of establishing control for people who feel as though they don't have any control over their digital selves. But consent has been widely misinterpreted and abused. Um, DPAs, data protection authorities, have been talking about this for a long time. Now uh, everyone has their first experience of the GDPR seared into their memories as a tool by companies to corral compliance into existing practices and perhaps new ones. Um, we think that that is, in some ways, that's an attempt to weaponise consent in the GDPR, nudging, cajoling, bullying you into agreeing or else forming, forfeiting, forfeiting the surface, service that you have uh, taken for granted up till now is more like coercion than consent. Consent, according to EU law, should be freely given, informed and specific. The third um, point that I wanted to raise was accountability, but as I've just seen the sign telling me to stop, I'll allow that to come out in the, um, in the discussion. We're leaving accountability as extra. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Chairman Wheeler, um, uh, I, I kind of want to give you free reign for this next four, <laughs> four minutes. But, but I, I think we would all like to hear you reflect on the recent changes in this last week. Um, but also if you could look forward and imagine we are not in the political climate we are in, in a, in a climate where we might be um, uh, really looking at, at solutions and looking at, ex at, at taking some of the principles behind net neutrality to other spheres. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, thank you, uh, Zephyr and, and Barry and Open Markets, thank you for putting this program together and for inviting me. I want to begin by channeling my inner Richard John, okay? Um, three things that <clears throat> history tells us about news. One, the delivery of news has always been technology driven. Two, economic gatekeepers always seized upon that technology to exploit it for economic benefit. And three, in each iteration, there has arisen, sometimes finally, oversight of the gatekeepers. And so that brings us to today. And why should we expect anything to be different than it ever has been since Gutenberg in 1450. When Pew tells us 61% of the American people get at least some of their news from online, <coughs> when we've got gatekeepers like Google that's got 40% of the online search, or Facebook that's got four of the top five mobile platforms, and we have today no meaningful oversight. So how do we get to that kind of oversight? We've always gotten there before in history as technology has changed things. There are two types of meaningful oversight. One is antitrust. We've heard a lot of talk about that today. We heard Senator Klobuchar. It needs to be made relevant to digital realities, which means we've got to start taking on some of the base concepts of the Chicago School because, for instance, how do you apply those concepts of consumer welfare based on price when everything's free? We need new tools, and we've got to recognize that antitrust should be used with all due respect to Congressman Cicilline, who's going to follow. Antitrust should be used to create structural remedies or solutions or preventions, not to create immunity and new monopolies. <coughs> the second option is operational rules, and that's what we were trying to do with net neutrality. And yes, yesterday was a black day. We need, so, so how do we deal with these operational issues? One, you need rules, not enforcement adjudication after the fact, but rules. 
The rules need to be common. The stack is collapsing. <laughs> zeros and ones, you don't know whether it's a network or, or what goes over the network these days. It's got to be consistent, except for the fact that we have to recognize that networks are special because without them, you couldn't have the other stuff. And that oversight needs to be based on three concepts. Openness, privacy, and protecting competition where it exists and promoting it where it doesn't. The cause of the current non-functional market is the domination of the capital asset of the 21st century data. <clears throat> and the domination of that asset affects all markets, especially the media by creating an information bottleneck where the ability to reach consumers no longer lies, as Richard was telling us, things had always been local. Now, for the first time, it's national. Data is used to crush competition. How can you start a competitor if your key asset is held by others? And to expand into new markets. I'm all for AI, but if AI is understood to be nothing more than the use of lots of data points in order to have a highly probable conclusion, those who control those data points control AI and therefore control the future. So let me close where I began because I just got the sign. <laughs> News has always been technology driven. Gatekeepers arise to exploit that technology and people step in to provide oversight. People step in. There must be rules, but who makes the rules? And today, we exist in an environment where the people who run the government do not believe in rules other than the rules that are made by the powerful or dictated by the powerful. The point that we are at now that is important to free markets and to the free press is that the people, through their representatives, need to be stepping forward and saying, no, excuse me. Throughout history, the people have always stepped up to deal with new technology and make new rules. Now is our turn. Thank you. Good. So I'm going to ask a few questions, and then we're going to open it up um, uh, at 4.15 for audience questions. Um, so one of the questions I, I had, this is to both Jason and uh, <laughs> Olivier. Uh, Mark Thompson and the, his talk at lunch, were you both there for that? Yep. Um, addressed the, the high quality news strategy that you also talked about. And um, uh, what Mark Thompson said, I paraphrase, is that this is actually a, a dystopian strategy because it centralizes decision making uh, mm -hmm. within Facebook. Um, so I'd like to hear your response to that. And then for Olivier, related to this, if I hear you right, <laughs> Um, you are saying that if Facebook, maybe I'm hearing you right and then pushing it, just <laughs> if Facebook does choose to have any kind of sorting strategy for, let's just take news for a second, for sorting what is news and what is high quality is not high quality, those 230 protections or those protections from uh, liability should be removed. Not that they are under current laws, but they should be removed. So I want to understand if that's what your, your argument is. But Jason, I'd like to hear your. Sure, sure. Happy to address that. And uh, I think this is, a, this is a really interesting question because it's one where I think different publishers would have very different perspectives on that. And I think even the, the two Thompsons that spoke today, Mark and Robert, may come out in a different place in terms of how platforms should be thinking about quality and trust and factoring that into the content they show. I think just one, just before I get into that particular question, one fundamental point just to make about people's news feeds, that is that ultimately they are largely in control of what they see on our platform platform, we don't just randomly show articles or videos to people. The content that they're going to see is from their friends and family, 
or from publishers they follow or sports teams they follow or groups that they're a part of. Our goal in, in having an algorithm at the first place is just to put that content in an order that we think is going to create the most relevant and engaging experience for that person each time they log in. There's a lot more content than people have time to consume, so we just want to show them the most interesting stuff first. Um, and that is a core reason for why we have uh, an algorithm in the first place. When it comes to quality, I think um, this is something that we are placing more uh, emphasis on. I think we've always tried to understand how relevant content is to people. Um, for example, a couple years ago, we introduced a measurement around how long people spent reading an article after they clicked off of Facebook to that article, and then when they came back with the understanding that the longer time they spent, it's probably a better, more engaging experience if they then came back to Facebook and shared that article with their friends. So we've always been interested in trying to get at these questions of quality. Um, the broadly trusted measure that Mark was commenting on is specifically one where we actually survey, currently it's US only, although we're looking to internationalize it, survey audiences. Um, do you know this publisher? How much do you trust the content from this publisher? And we're looking for publishers that are broadly trusted across a wide spectrum of audiences. Also looking for publishers who are broadly mistrusted across wide spectrum of audiences. And they get corresponding uh, 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 benefits uh, within Newsfeed um, according to how they are scored on that. That is by no means the only measure that goes into what someone sees or, or how a publisher performs on Facebook. We're also just starting to try to better understand how informative content is. Um, you can survey people after they've read an article to see, did they come away from this feeling more informed? Are they actually more informed after reading this piece of content? And then local news, which is the other place where we have a point of emphasis, we're uh, attacking that one from an entirely different perspective. And for that, we're actually just looking at where is most of a publisher's content consumed. If it is in a given locality, we actually are going to show more content from that publisher to people in that community. They, of course, have to be connected to that publisher. Um, but that's a core way that that algorithm, that part of the algorithm is working. So there's actually a variety of ways we're getting at this. The end goal is to just show people better, higher quality content at the end of the day that's going to leave them feeling more informed. Olivia. So one question is, when does that all become, and the, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a welcome sort of development, a kind of recognition of the place that Facebook and others occupy in our information ecosystem. When does that activity become the sort of publishing that we've historically always associated with traditional publishers? And the reason that's important is because, Zephyr, you ask me, is the sorting that Facebook is engaging in, and this is, this is high level sorting, right? Does that suggest that they ought to be obliged under current laws in the ways that traditional publishers are? And my, my, my sense is yes. But I, I want to put this into context. In 1996, when the CDA was passed, my answer would have been no, might have been no, in that the environment then was far different. So I, it's a complicated sort of scenario for me because when you're just talking about the news feed, um, it's pretty straightforward. But in fact, Facebook is, is faces separate markets, right? It has ancillary markets. Its ad service, for example, is appended to the social media app that we um, m most of us engage with. But the the data that they are that they're developing for the purposes, I mean, I you know, I don't know what the, how the algorithm runs, so I'm seeing it from this end. But the way that they collect data and process it and repurpose it, for in the ways that um, Jason has described, suggests to me that there is a lot more activity going on than has would have hist historically we've ever thought was going on. Um, so as a matter of time, at least, I think we should reevaluate the immunity under 230. And more than that, I think the sort of leveraging of a position as facing several markets is evocative of um, you know, the sorts of monopoly um, historically that, that courts and regulators have been worried about. Uh, Chairman Wheeler, um, I, I saw, saw you taking some notes. And <laughs> so I, I I'd, 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 in I'd like to, uh, to, to respectfully uh, disagree with my new friend. <laughs> may not be a friend after this, New <laughs> and Jason. Uh, when you said consumers are in control of content, mm -hmm. no, consumers aren't in control of content because consumers aren't in control of the information that is used to make the content decisions that are delivered to us. 
one of the things, so, so I, I wrote a, an op-ed in the New York Times suggesting that what we ought to have is open APIs. Olivier just said, I don't know how the API, how, how the algorithms work, and I don't know, I don't want to know how your algorithms work. But when I pick up a copy of the Washington Post, I see the decisions that have been made uh, for editorial content right there in front of me, and, and Media Matters and other kinds of groups can track, okay, what are the trends in that? But when I get my Facebook news feed, I don't know what's going on, because all the decisions had been made for me by some kind of a black box. But if we had open APIs, where, and I call them public interest APIs, where you could, you had an open, you had an API where you could see what was going in, and you could see what was going out, and to whom it was going. Then you would be able to say, okay, here's how Facebook is slicing and dicing based on the information they have about me. And it would be exactly the same kind of application that Google Maps is, for instance, where Uber builds on top of, of <coughs> Google Maps. They don't need to know what the algorithm is. They just need to have an open API. And we can have functions that can come along and then say to us as consumers, here is how your information is being used, and therefore here is how, uh, how uh, uh, news is being delivered to you. Mm -hmm. We should do a lot of that today, and this is not my area of expertise, but uh, within our advertising space, where you can click a little button and see why am I seeing this ad, and we actually do explain to you the kind of information that might have been used in, in the targeting of this particular so ad. So would you be willing to open your APIs so that there could be third parties, not just you, that make those interpretations? Well, I think that's not for me to say. We make a lot of data available. I think broadly, transparency is something we are more and more interested in. Um, we're doing that around political advertising or advertising with political content right now. Uh, you heard the Honest Ads Act talked about earlier. We've endorsed that. We're also actually just moving ahead of any legislation in that space. Um, many publishers have referred to that as well because there's an active conversation going on right now between Facebook and the publishing community around whether news, whether they're news editorials or news advertorials or whatever it might be, if that content should also be included in an archive of um, advertising with political content. But we actually believe in pretty extreme transparency around that. We're going to have an archive where all political ads are live for seven years. Um, it'll give journalists an opportunity, academics an opportunity, people an opportunity to see the kind of advertising that's out there, some of the tar targeting information, and exactly what's going on in that space. So we actually think sunlight is a great thing. So I'm going to start to throttle the conversation, as it were, <laughs> uh, given limited time. But if, You can. If, it's if, legal now. <laughs> right. <laughs> If, if folks could just give me a sense of how many questions there are out here, because I, I know I have some questions. Um, okay, and uh, I'll, I, I also want to give a chance for Richard and, and yeah. Christian to jump in. Um, uh, if you want to jump in on this discussion, then I'll um, open it up to questions. Do you want, yeah. you want to say anything in particular here? Just, just to make to, to underscore something that uh, Chairman uh, Wheeler said, um, and and to clarify. Historically, yes, we've had technologies and then gatekeepers, but in the case of Section 230, in the case, case of Telegraph Act of 1848, they co-evolved. I mean, it wasn't like there was a long gap. So in a way, Facebook and Google are political constructions. They're not products of technology to court. And I think it's very important to, to keep that in mind always when we think about regulation. Regulation is not something we kind of come in at the end and sweep up a mess that's already been created. In a way, the mess or the situation, political co-creation was there from the start. And as Olivier describes so well, the circumstances have changed. And that, that's what's happened here and that's what's happened in the past. And it, it's different in different countries. There's nothing pure about technology that means you're going to get a certain outcome. Different political economy, different rules of the game, different outcomes. That's one reason the United States has evolved so differently than, than Europe. 
Yeah. Yeah. The, the um, it's it's a it's a classical economist solution to to try and when there's a there may be a monopoly problem is to, to free up the assets and um, allow competitors to access them. The the issue uh, with personal information is that. Um, when you when you do something with it, it has an impact on people. That's why there are there are constraints on what you can do, and so you need to you need to. I was about to talk about accountability. Um, whoever has that data and is deriving value from that data, they have to pay a bit of a price for doing that. So they need, they need to they need to consider what the impact is going to be on individuals. They need to make sure there are safeguards in place. In principle, they should they should try to find ways of not using it at all. Um, those are the principles, and not just in the in the EU, but around the world. And and one last thing, the. Um, the reason why this is important is because it reminds me of the you know, in, 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 in the original Ghostbusters, uh, they basically put all of the all of these ghouls in a in a in a stinking machine, and uh, and eventually you know the the uh, public health authorities came and ordered them to open it up, and all hell broke loose. So uh, we've. In the, the UK system that we've got now, the reason why everyone's in a in a in a in a, in a crisis about uh, the Cambridge Analytica case is that nobody knows what's going on with this data. It's completely out of control, right. and so I'm not sure the solution, the sustainable solution, would be to open up the vaults to um, to, to everybody in the interests of um, freeing up the, um, the the structure of the market. All right. So quick quick questions and quick answers. Yes. Go ahead, Mark. Um, what policy should be implemented to reduce the network effects that appear to be making Facebook a natural monopoly? So much of the discussion today has been focused on the market power of Facebook. But I haven't heard any discussion in either the discussion paper or the presentation about networks effects. We have a long tradition in the United States of dealing with network effects, network effects through public policy. But there's no discussion of them also in the discussion paper, which is dozens of policies many today, why isn't that part of the discussion and how could it be part of the discussion? So in a, in a few pithy sentences, those of you who want to respond, um, what do you think of as the, as the response to the, to, uh, the question? Uh, networks historically have been regulated as public utilities. Uh, that's the way we regulated telephone. Uh, and that's the way, yeah, network industries. So I'd say if you can get lawmakers to turn Facebook into a public utility, that would be a response in keeping with the best American best practice. <clears throat> but beyond networks, the concepts ought to be the same across both networks and non-networks. Openness and portability. Okay, so the so the so the issue is. Uh, how do we get, uh, so, so, so if we have now a situation where there are only a few powerful gatekeepers who sit on what the economists call the digital or the oil of the, of the new economy, okay? How do we open that up? Because they're the new sheikdoms, okay? How do, how do we open that up, number one? Number two, how do we provide for, for portability? I mean, we all remember when number portability came to right. our cell phones. It is exactly an analogous situation. My asset, is my information is my telephone number. And if you're telling me that I can't use my asset, which is what's happening right now, that's not right. What happened when Mm -hmm. Portability for numbers was was finally uh, enacted. Prices went down, competition went up, services went up, but it doesn't happen when you're hoarding information assets. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to make it quick? Okay. Uh, yes. Let's tell. Uh, Mr. White, uh, like, yeah. uh, Mr. Dr. White was asked, uh, who are competitors? Goodness. We have so many competitors in so many different spaces. When I talk to news organizations, I can tell you who they think about uh, as the other platforms that they engage with deeply. Um, Google, certainly. Uh, YouTube in the video space. 
a lot of them, especially on the hard news or more specialized uh, niche news areas, Twitter is a pretty important player. In the lifestyle space, you actually have Pinterest that sends a fair amount of referral traffic out to publishers. BuzzFeed has done a good job of capitalizing on that. And then I think with more of the, the kind of lifestyle brands, um, uh, you see Snapchat doing really, really well in the more visual storytelling. So quite a number of them. And, and I can say when we, when we go and talk to our publishing partners, they'll be really honest with us if they think we're not delivering enough value to them. And so you know what, we're actually leaning back a little bit right now and gonna wait for this or that product to get to a place where we feel like there's more monetary value there for us. And that's okay, and they're free to do that. And they can go work with other platforms a little more, and then maybe they'll come back around if we make things a little bit better for them. But is there a direct competitor or just those partial uh, competitors? I'm not sure what you're asking. Is there another Facebook? Is there another competing network that is resembles you all? I think, you know, for me, where the space I'm in, we have a lot of competitors. So I think as you go around the globe, you also see the social networking and messaging space look very different from region to region and platform to platform, whether Android or iOS and so on. So I think globally, there's a ton of competitors. Uh, Matt. And uh, others, put up your hand so I know what other questions are out there. Okay, thanks. Uh, this question is for Christian. Uh, so you mentioned, uh, weaponizing the use of consent, bullying uh, users into consent. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to ask about GDPR if uh, dominant platforms end up using it to gain market share. You know, does that, what does that represent for the attempt to actually implement these kinds of rules? What's next? Well, that's a great question. The, the, um, the GDPR doesn't discriminate between um, uh, whether a company is, is dominant or a competitor. Um, it does. It is scalable in the sense that if you're a small company, your obligations are much smaller unless you're doing really risky things with your data. Um, that's something which is often uh, overlooked. Um, but this is where the um, the overlap with antitrust comes into play because antitrust authorities have the ability to impose certain behavioral standards on dominant companies which in turn would have should have a, a trickle, trickle down effect on competitors who are forced to emulate that behavior um, so um, what I would say is, first of all, that if, you're, if there is a problem with the way a dominant company is behaving, and it could be in that they're you know, abusing their dominance in that respect, the way they're using consent, for example, um, that, would be, that would be an area where antitrust authorities might want to intervene with some support from DPAs, data protection authorities. The other, the other thing to say, the reason I mentioned it, is that consent is, is just like, um, consent is supposed to be freely given, so you can't force me to give my consent, because then it becomes something else. Um, you can have a contract which you require me to sign. That's a different part, there's a different legal basis for processing first information under EU law. So I think a lot of the discussions in the next few months, next year or so, are going to be around whether or not you know, certain companies, and I'm not just talking about Facebook, I'm talking about across the board, the millions of, the, the, the hundreds of emails that we've all been receiving, whether or not companies have been taking a, respecting the spirit of the law, if, if not the actual letter of the law. Mm -hmm. um, rapid fire, 15 second question, I have one over here just so we get the questions in and then each of you has a chance to both respond to the question, questions that come up, but, but also if, one of the things that came up from many, many of the comments was, was ideology or sort of a way of seeing the world. Um, I, I heard that from several of you. If you were to see a fundamental shift in the way that the public understands these puzzles, can, can you think of one or two fundamental shifts um, that, that you think we should be seeking? So yes, gentlemen back here. Hi, uh, Nick Johnson, author of the book Modern Monopolies. Uh, in the financial sector, they have a term for companies that are too big, they call them systemically important. Uh, would that concept potentially be useful here for focusing on the monopoly platforms while not hurting innovation on the smaller scale? All right, so you can answer and then... Yeah, yeah. here's a great answer. Yes. <laughs> the, at, a, at a first resort of people who are opposed to activities targeted to big companies is to say, oh my God, it'll have a terrible effect on small companies. 
No. <laughs> you can make determinations about dominance and decide accordingly. And I think I'm a big supporter of what Christian has done. And the, and the key is going to be the administrative decisions and the judicial rulings that come out that help set those kind of parameters. A any final words before the congressman comes along? The is the congressman here? Right here. Oh, yes, hi. <laughs> so, I'll, yes. I'll say something, yeah. Um, I just on the history of antitrust, the consequences of antitrust in the long term have not only been to break up large firms and make them small firms. It's been to change the conduct of big firms. And if we're thinking about access to information, unlocking the vaults, I think the consent decree, the 56 consent decree, opened up the transistor market, which was a result of an antitrust suit, is, a, is an analogy worth conjuring with. You don't necessarily have to break up the big firms to fundamentally restructure them. And historically, antitrust has been a very effective tool for doing just that. Final code is here, we good. Thank you, uh, join me in thanking this incredible panel.